So New Zealand's divided into three missions. You got Auckland, which basically just covers Auckland City, the biggest city in New Zealand. You've got the Hamilton mission, which covers kind of the northern half of the North Island of New Zealand. And it's got Hamilton as where the temple is. So that's a huge member base right there. And then you have the Wellington mission, which is the biggest geographically. It's got the entire lower half of the North Island and all of the South Island. And because of that, it's the most rural. It's really the most spread out. And that's also the mission where the church is the smallest or you could say weakest. Um, also, in just modern times, the, the Australian economy is a lot stronger. And so the mission where we were in had a lot of people leaving and going to Australia for work. And some of the units and wards or, or branches have suffered a lot because of that, because just so many members have been moving to where the mining jobs are, right? But the church's history in New Zealand was actually, is actually quite strong. It's the Maori language, which is the language of the indigenous Pacific Islanders. The, it was one of the first languages, really. I want to say it was the fifth, but I might be making that up. Um, one of the earliest languages, though, that the Book of Mormon was translated into. And there's really a strong, in the Wellington Mission specifically, in the lower North Island part, a really strong member base in a lot of these really small rural towns, like the first one that I went to. Because way back in the day, there was this young missionary named Matthew Cowley. And he was pretty much the greatest thing since sliced bread for New Zealand. And went around, you know, he got there, didn't speak a word of the Maori language that all the missionaries had to learn at the time. And so he just, you know, there's lots of legends about him. The common one that I was always told is he couldn't speak. He went up on a mountain for two weeks by himself. Um, nobody knew what he was doing, nobody heard a word from him in all that time. And then he came down two weeks later speaking fluent Maori, not only fluent, but better than any of the tribal chiefs or anyone could speak because he was, he had learned it, you know, he had gifted tongues. It was supernatural. It was a miracle, right? But in any case, Matthew Kelly had the best Maori out of anybody, went around baptizing, in, you know, whole villages and things. And it was just super famous, well-known. Um, New Zealand government people would have him translate important documents into Maori just because his Maori was better than anybody's, uh, <laughs> even the native Maori's. And so some of the, a lot of that influence still lives in parts of the Wellington Mission today. Um, a lot of areas where I served in particular um, were places that had a lot of influence from him. And people still remember him. The generation that actually knew him personally is right in the final stages of dying out right now, sadly. But, his, but the legacy kind of goes on. And because of that, New Zealand, and especially among the Maoris, the church has always been very strong and very solid since the beginning. So Wellington Mission has no temple. You, if you're in the Wellington Mission, you will never go to the temple. Don't get your hopes up. It's not going to happen. <laughs> um, stakes, districts-wise, I think there's 10 stakes and districts combined in the mission, uh, if memory serves. Uh, probably, probably six of those are stakes and four of those are districts. Maybe it's seven and three. And a lot of the stakes and districts and wards and branches are kind of undersized, a lot because of this um, emigration to Australia. So a lot of, a number of the wards I served in, like my first ward had, I think, an average of 30 people attending on Sunday. So <laughs> not really ward size, but again, it's, um, it was bigger not that long ago before the economy changed. <laughs> I think New Zealand is easiest to look at the people if you divide them into really the two main groups that we have which are one would be the Pakia, that's the Maori word for white person. Um, they tell me that literally it translates to white pig, but you know, that's the word you'll find for what otherwise they'll call English or European people um, <laughs> like myself. And the Pakia, they tend to be, uh, the older generation especially is Christian. They're generally Anglican, Church of England, um, or Catholic, and, but although there's many other you know, Protestant churches as well in the mix. Um, but the Pakia in general are becoming more and more secular and less interested in religion. The majority of my investigators were um, Maori instead of Pakia, right? They weren't um, the white New Zealanders, but they were the indigenous New Zealanders, um, both because of the areas where I served uh, had a higher Maori population, but also just because they were more willing to listen to us. They were they're the poor class of people. They're you know a minority group. And they were much more ready to listen to what we say not just, I think, because of that um, socioeconomic factor, but also just because I think this is a good place to kind of say about how spiritual the Maori just are by themselves. Um, if I had a dollar for every time a Maori person had told me that they had a vision or a dream or an angel or a revelation or this or a miracle or a healing or something, I, I wouldn't be super wealthy, but I'd be able to take myself out to a couple of nice meals. 
there was um there was a lot of spiritual phenomena that happened in my mission and most of that centered around the Maori people rather than the Pakia. People quite understand that when people come to the door, you're either the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses. A lot of times we were mistaken for the Jehovah's Witnesses, but that's when we would just say, oh, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and kind of emphasize that whole take. But apart from that, uh, the general viewpoint that New Zealanders have of the Mormons is probably similar to what you'd find in America or Europe, is that they tend to come to your door, they might annoy you a little bit, they're generally good people, nothing too out of the ordinary in that regard. So I served from July 2013 to July 2015. My first area was Dannyverk. It's a little rural country farm town. Lots of sheep, lots of unemployment. <laughs> My second area was Johnsonville, which is just a suburb of Wellington, the biggest city. And that was um, kind of more happening from you know busy just people standpoint, but we didn't actually teach as much there, oddly enough. My third area was a suburb of Hastings. It's called Havelock North. Uh, that's Hastings has, has two suburbs. It has a wealthy suburb and it has a poor suburb. The poor suburb is has an entire stake all by itself. It's tremendously successful for missionaries. But Havelock North, where I was, is the wealthy suburb, and we had very little work going for us there. But we had a lovely beach in the area, and it was really great. I loved that area. Uh, I wasn't there for long, though, because then I got moved to my fourth area, which was my favorite overall. It was my only area on the South Island. It's called Greymouth. And it was the rainiest, it's the rainiest part of New Zealand, the West Coast. And it's also fairly cold. It doesn't snow there like it does in the far south of New Zealand. But I did get pretty cold there. But during the summer months when I was there, it was just super beautiful, um, incredible coastal drives that we had to take to get to district meeting and back every week. Um, it was just really great. So I loved that area. And then my fifth area was, I was again in kind of a, um, a suburb of Wellington. It was Lower Hut. So... And that was a good area too, I really enjoyed that. So I spent about half my mission in and around Wellington City in kind of, you know, an urban environment. And then the other half really pretty rural in the middle of nowhere, lots of sheep, lots of um, unemployment. And so the difference between the two was really big. The missionary work I always found was a lot better actually the more rural you got. Because um, generally people were more humble, they were also generally more Maori, um, which is also a factor. Because, yeah, the cities tend to be more diverse, more multicultural. So in the cities, you'll get, you know, um, not only the main three groups, right? White, Maori, Pacific Islander, but you'll also get um, Indians, Asians, and things in, um, in and around Wellington, and maybe Christchurch even. Um, but not so much if you go to, like, the middle of nowhere, Dannyverk or Palmerston North. You get a lot of Fijians in Palmerston North, actually, but... Uh, that's a topic for another day. And so the city, I always found, the life is a lot more fast-paced. Um, it's maybe more fun just because if you're in the country, you're going to be the only missionaries for like hundreds of miles probably. And you don't always get to like do things with other missionaries on P-Days and stuff. Whereas if you're in the city, you're going to be around other elders. You're going to be able to have a game of touch rugby on P-Day or some basketball or a card game if you all got really bored and it was raining. And the cities also just have bigger wards, so you'll probably get fed better in the city. But then on the other hand, the country, the people are more humble, generally more teachable. Um, and so it's probably, you will do more teaching in the country, in my experience at least. And maybe have more to do in that sense, but at the same time, the country is like pretty slow because there's just fewer people around. And so uh, when you weren't teaching in the country, I felt like it was hard to find things to do, hard to keep yourself occupied and you don't usually get fed as much, which is a serious downside.